and, and racism here at home to support the war. And of course, we were mo most familiar with the racism that was used during the Vietnam War um, to demonize the Vietnamese, you know, using racist slurs such as gooks to convince um, the population that they were less than human to, to help dehumanize them and, and aid soldiers in, in taking their lives. But there was also a revolt against that racism that I think was best expressed by Muhammad Ali, the champ himself, who said, no Vietnamese ever called me a nigger. I'm not going to get drafted in your war for imperialism. And I think Malcolm X put it best. He said, don't put me in your airplane and fill it with bombs and tell me to go bomb the enemy, because I don't have that far to go. <laughs> Today, the U.S. government is using the same racism to sell this war in Iraq and to obtain it, the recruits it needs to fight in it. George W. Bush declared in the months after September 11th, uh, the, the terrorist attacks, quote, you're either with us or against us, and he used the term of Islamofascism um, to make it known that the, the world's Muslim population was to be feared and, should, and is now under attack. And then you have um, Dan Gilmer, Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, who came uh, to a March 6th luncheon last year and told a, told a crowd uh, uh, in Washington, he said, quote, while it may be true, and probably is, that not all Muslims are terrorists, it also happens to be true that nearly are, all terrorists are Muslims. He's sitting in front of the halls of government and not a single member of either party, the Democrat or Republican, called him out and said that that is racist garbage that has no place in, in our country. But that kind, of, that kind of talk from the top of society is, is creating the space for racism in, in America to the point where you have David uh, Horowitz organized um, in the fall a campus tour. Did people see this on their campuses around the Islamofascism Awareness Week where he came to basically spread um, racist lies about Arabs and Muslims to justify the war. Then, we all know the phenomenon of driving while black. I've experienced it many times, but the government has now expanded that, that phenomenon to flying all Arab. And the special Northwest brand of this is ferrying all Arab. If people, read, if people read about the two Arabs who got apprehended on the, on the ferry boats here, um, for taking photographs, right? And that's the kind of um, racist fear that they're trying to whip up here uh, to justify their war. Or how about Samuel Arney, right? He's on a hunger strike right now. He's falsely accused for uh, a charity that, that he put together um, of financing terrorism, and he's, he's wasting away in prison and needs our solidarity. And of course, that it's the correct thing to do to oppose racism in all its forms, but we also will never be able to challenge these, the, the perpetrators of this war without it. So I'll just wrap up on, uh, on, on this two points here. I think the success of the Vietnam anti-war movement was largely predicated on the revolt against racism. The revolt against racism was shown in two ways. One, the black troops themselves, right, um, listening to that Malcolm X quote, listening to Muhammad Ali and realizing that the rice farmers weren't their enemies, it was right here at home, right? And that helped to fuel a rebellion of, of troops inside the U.S. military. But it was also the rejection of anti-Vietnamese racism and the identification of the anti-war movement with the so-called enemy that I think actually helped end that war. So the movement went from, from chanting, give peace a chance, to chanting, ho, 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 chi minh, the NLF is going to win. And that was the kind of, that was, that was the kind of seriousness that the movement um, decided that, that they were going to combat racism. So I think today, when they say we can't pull the troops out of Iraq because the country would descend into chaos, I think we need to remember the long history of this government claiming uh, that the brown people are, are living in backward nations and, you know, calling them uncivilized and that they need us there to protect them. I think when they say um, that this war is going to bring liberation to Iraq, we should respond, where's the liberation for Samuel Ari? Where's the liberation?
reparation for the millions of undocumented workers here are being persecuted? Where's the liberation for Sean Bell, a black man in New York City who got shot with 50 bullets? I think not, I think the other thing is if we don't challenge, um, if we don't challenge this kind of anti-Arab bigotry, all of us are, are, have our civil liberties at stake, because we'll be next. If they can get Arabs and Muslims, they'll come after immigrants, they'll come after black people, they'll come after all working people in this country. And not challenging Islamophobic bigotry divides and weakens our movement, um, and it keeps Arabs and, Arabs and Muslims who are most impacted by this war, I think, on the outside. So I think any anti-war movement worthy of the name has to take up defense of Arabs and Muslims' rights and all, all working people and people of color and stand against this racist scapegoating and declare an end to this war.